We are good to go. Yes. Yeah. She'll it's, she'll uh, join us shortly. Okay. Perfect. So, um, thank you very much for joining us for the second ESG section of the conference. Uh, uh, once again, we I would just say a few words to thank uh, Pedro, Aaron, and Laura, who's joining uh, in a second, uh, for accepting uh, our invitation. It's great to have you. Um, uh, I'll pass the introduction to Pedro, but I just want to say that hopefully we're going to be able to have you also presenting in Brazil soon. Uh, we are doing everything online this time uh, again, but uh, we still have the hope that we can have a long discussion about ESG and other topics uh, um, here uh, soon. Yeah. Pedro, I would like to pass the word to you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start with a few words in Portuguese, Aaron. I apologize, but so bem-vindos a todos. É um prazer moderar este segundo painel de ESG. Uh, eu vou partilhar então o meu ecrã só para um, apresentar então um, o programa. Hoje temos o, o segundo uh, dia. Uh, so, Pedro, I like to pass the word to you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start with a few words. Oh, sorry, sorry. No problem. So uh, the second the second panel is with um, Aaron Yoon and um, from North Northwestern Kellogg, and Laura Starks, who's just uh, joining us from UT Austin. And to Aaron and to uh, Laura, a, a couple pictures from Brazil. Last couple times I was down there. I know Aaron's advisor is from Brazil, and Laura, this is a, a literal uh, photo from my iPhone, both both occasions. So, um, um grande abraço para para virtual. <laughs> so a big hug to Brazilians uh, that are joining us, and um, you know all all the best, and uh, hope everything everything gets uh, improves uh, very soon over there. Um, I did. Um, do a, a shameful plug uh, to my uh, CFA report last time. And it's just uh, for people who are not um, e uh, so acquainted with ESG as, as an introduction, uh, I'll put it in the chat later, the link as well. Uh, we did, uh, will not repeat this from yesterday, but you can find the recording uh, last uh, uh, last session also on the YouTube for Sociedade Financeira the Finances do Brazil for, for the Brazilian Finance Society. You'll find a previous recording. And I, I assume you have ca caught up a little bit on ESG and why it's been the focus of major uh, investors and corporations. But again, ESG, you know, E would be climate change, um, you know, uh, pollution, uh, social would be uh, relation with the workforce, which is something Aaron will, will talk about in, in his work today. And governance is broader, and Laura's been, uh, you know, a, a big um, uh, contributor to that literature, but how the interests of the company may align with shareholders, how important it is important and all that. So in the case of Brazil, of course, you're, you're familiar with car wash or Lava Jato and other, other instances of uh, uh, governance gotten wrong. It's been the focus of major investors and it's been the focus of major corporations as, uh, as in the statement here by the uh, um, business roundtable, which is something I know Aaron and, and Laura will speak to both the investor side and the corporate side, um, how much of a focus that's been. Uh, last, uh, so as I mentioned yesterday, we talked mostly about climate change and the, the pressing uh, challenge of um, you know increasing greenhouse emissions the physical and the stranded asset risks the transition risks and the physical risks coming from uh, from those um, assets and we and the recording is available on on the Brazilian finance uh, association YouTube page uh, so today uh, we're going to talk more about the investors um, so I thought you know, Laura's paper will talk specifically about um, different types of investors. And I wanted just to highlight some facts before we, we dive in and focus on institutional investors. Why? Because they are 75% uh, of shares or about, you know, three quarters of shares in the US markets, you can see there in, in yellow or um, are held by institutions. So mutual funds, pension funds, you know, other products like that. 
uh, manage for other people, other people's money. And, and uh, historically, there's been a big concentration of their efforts on G, and uh, Laura's been a big uh, contributor to that literature. She's written surveys, which I also recommend uh, reading up on, um, of how, uh, you know, as investors become bigger and more uh, concentrated, uh, they might um, push for more shareholder-friendly uh, governance arrangements. So if they are unsatisfied with a firm, particularly uh, in terms of uh, their governance, they can either exit, you know, sell their shares, so-called Wall Street Walk, or they can voice by engaging with management, voting their shares and so forth. So there's a, a lots of academic studies on the 1980s and 90s uh, on the activism ways. The latest version of that is the hedge fund activist wave, which is more recent, the last couple of decades. Um, and um, again, we'll, you know, uh, defer you to, to the study, to the CFA report for the references, but Laura has written several survey uh, articles on that herself. Um, and then uh, outside the US, which has been more my focus, um, I've been uh, you know, particularly in places like Brazil or others, um, you know, foreign investors may be more relevant than sometimes the local investors, and they might be exporting some some of these governance practices that first you kind of saw waves in the U.S. to other countries, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere. And finally, there's a big focus these days on the big three. If you look at the big three, they now hold, um, and that's BlackRock, State Street, and Vega, the largest. Um, you know, BlackRock literally broke $10 trillion in AUM <laughs> this week uh, that was announced and a, a large chunk of that is equities. So they're one of the largest holders, you know, of equities all over the world. And how much they do, do they do too much? Do they do too little since they cannot hold, um, you know, uh, should they care and engage with the company? So it's, it might be too early to tell, but there's a lot of academic work on that which I highly recommend reading up on again. And Aaron's work today will, and so we'll, we'll hear more from Laura on, on um, different types of investors in particularly um, uh, long-term versus short-term investors if they make a difference on, 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 on ESG. And so focusing more on ENS than the G aspect, um, there's a huge theoretical debate and I know Aaron will talk about this as well, about like traditional economic textbooks say, you know, shareholder value maximization, the Milton Friedman rule versus kind of my colleagues here at Darden and others uh, that have come out with stakeholder theory. Um, uh, Ed Freeman is a colleague of mine here at the school that organizations make mistake, um, you know, multiple stakeholders into account. Um, and so the question Aaron will pose is whether do you get compensated by the firms that, you know, um, uh, do better for their workers, for their communities and so forth, do better or not. So there's, you know, Alex Edmonds is a big, um, um, has made some contribution and there's a nice book I would recommend, the Grow the Pie book, by that is the distillation of the academic evidence on this, but for a general audience. And so it's, it's very, you know, uh, it's very um, murky, the evidence, you know, on the one hand, you would expect actually investors like yesterday, uh, with Lubos uh, work, investors to be compensated to, to um, be holding the not non-green stocks or the sin stocks, let's say. Um, and uh, on the other hand, as money shifts into ESG, for, for a decade or so, um, Lobos was showing that actually there was higher returns, higher in, in the ESG strategies, but this could be a temporary shift in capital. So given the limited sample periods and, and, and some of the data challenges we have, um, you know, it, 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 may, it may be hard to do that. So Aaron has a, a, a new study, which he'll, he'll talk to us about as, as well, very recent. Um, and, and Laura will also talk to, to us about the horizon of the investors and, and, um, and so forth. Uh, so it, finally, I have on the survey, I have, uh, um, you know, spent a lot of time on um, uh, a particular type of investors, so-called uh, PIN investors. I'll, I'll skip that and um, some open questions as well. So. Uh, before we, we proceed, just opening my email this morning, there's a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, 
resource I wanted to highlight, which is Lazard's um, review. Every every uh, every half year, they they put a, a, a review together, and it's interesting how much ESG is part of the the activism review. So Exxon was targeting and made flashy news. And, and it's been mostly on, on this issues of energy transition, the same topics we've been targeted to the point that the board has been, you know, uh, restructured considerably as a result of investors' uh, efforts. And the other thing they, they point out is, of course, all the things we've, we're talking about here, you know, climate reporting, net zero, and, you know, uh, and, and the shift of capital towards ESG. So it doesn't, at least in my mailbox, this is getting in every day, and uh, uh, and uh, finally, just a plug for the efforts that uh, Laura, myself, and Caroline Flammer are doing. Is we're part of the PI Academic Committee, so this principles for responsible investing, and there will be a conference on which Aaron and others will be presenting. Uh, so uh, that will be in uh, September, and I'll leave those those uh, links uh, in in the chat after this. So without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce our speakers. Uh, so Laura uh, Starks is um, at UT Austin and, um, you know, very, um, it goes back a long time, her work here on, on the ESG space, but she has some very interesting new work on long horizon investors and, and um, and their engagement with the portfolio companies. And, and then Aaron will talk to us about firms that um, have, you know, uh, good ESG ratings, but also alignment of management. So he'll he'll dive in on some um, very cool data from from Glassdoor that's you know very very recent. So here's the plan: we start with Laura. She'll go for 30 minutes um, with her paper. Then we break for five just for Q and A. So if you have questions, put those on on the chat um, or the Q and A box. And then we follow with Aaron for 30 minutes, and um, you know have q a but also uh, open up more broadly and hopefully uh, uh finish up on time and i uh, and i will um, um you know it, stop sharing and ask uh, laura uh to uh, take the floor and um and present her work so thank you laura uh, really appreciate uh, you joining us remotely to brazil Okay, I'm. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm very. I'm very pleased to be here. I wish I were there uh, because I love visiting Brazil, um, and so I hope things open up soon for all of us. Um, okay, so what I wanted to talk about today was uh, corporate ESG profiles and investor horizons. And this is a this is a paper co-authored with with Parth Vinkit and Chief Azu, um, who used to be PhD students at um, U, the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, as everybody knows, there's been great global growth in the market for ESG. Um, and I'm going to skip these. Okay, the the another issues there have been increased regulation around ESG. If you look at the number of responsible investment related policy instruments over time across the world's 50 largest economies, you can see how it's been really skyrocketing. So I think it's an important um, thing to think about. Um, one notable exception to this is um, the U.S. But that seems to be changing uh, with the new administration and the new um, SEC. So the central focus of this paper is institutional investor preferences and corporations ESG profile and how those um, interact uh, and, and their potential motivations for such preferences um, that they can come from either um, taste and preferences or they can come from concerns about risk and return, uh, financial considerations. So the one thing I want to be sure and point out is that ESG investing is not equivalent to um, SRI investing. The um, it's it, it's the SRI investing, socially responsible investing, also called sustainable and responsible investing, is centered on negative screening. Um, the, people's tastes and preferences. But ESG has many diverse approaches. Um, so it can be taste and preferences, 
or it could be return and risk or a combination of the two. And, and so ESG has diverse approaches. Some of the common ones are a positive tilt toward ESG in the portfolio, negative screening, uh, a belief that there'll be return opportunities or very commonly risk mitigation. There have been a number of recent asset pricing theories on ESG, and I think that was on the program uh, yesterday. Um, All of these uh, recent theories introduce non-pecuniary utility into the investment decisions um, and the weightings of the percentage of ESG investors are important. Um, And the, the, um, uh, in, in a paper I've co-authored with Jackie Humphrey, um, Shimon Kogan, and Jacob Sagi, uh, we provide some experimental evidence that non-pecuniary values can actually affect investors' allocations decisions and to a lesser extent, their probability beliefs. So there are a number of theories on why ESG or, or corporate social responsibility should matter to investors for firm value. Um, firms with a higher ESG or corporate social responsibility profile. And the reason I'm using both words is because some of the research has used the terminology corporate social responsibility and some has used the cor- terminology ESG, but they attract more or firms that have, have this higher profile attract more higher paying customers. They have increased productivity due to higher employee morale. They have reduced litigation risk. They have decreased firm risk. And they have managers who avoid myopic decisions. So these are, these are different theories. Um, and we're going to focus on this bottom one, uh, that the managers avoid myopic decisions. And they're more likely to make longer-term decisions, avoiding short-termism. And so they should be of attraction to the longer-term investors. Uh, Short-termism has been a concern throughout the years. Um, John Maynard Keynes talked about it in 1935. Marty Lipton, a a famous lawyer in the United States, talked about it in 1979. Um, John Kay in the United Kingdom uh, did a review of financial markets and concluded that short-termism is a problem in the UK equity markets. Um, And then there have been a number of uh, prominent people who've talked about the need for long-term horizons for institutional investors. So um, I'm going to skip. So so the primary hypotheses that we test are, uh, first, investors with longer horizons prefer high ESG firms. The second one is if The first one's true. And if long-term investors prefer firms with higher ESG profiles, we will also expect these investors to to show more patience toward the higher ESG firms in their portfolios than the lower ESG firms in their portfolios. And and we're gonna look at earnings um, and how these long-term investors react to um, earnings and returns of the high ESG firms versus the low ESG firms in their own portfolios. So our major findings in terms of the first hypothesis, we do find that longer term investors weight their portfolios towards high ESG firms relative to short term investors. Uh, Those are looking at the portfolios of of the long term investors. We also Uh, do firm level tests in which we find the high ESG firms have a greater proportion of longer term investors. So we're looking at this from two separate uh, ways, perspectives, looking at the institutional investor portfolios and who they're holding, and then looking at the firms and who's holding the firms. And they're both consistent that longer term investors are, are the greater holders of the high ESG firms. We also do a shock to the firm's ESG standing when a firm is added or dropped from the FTSE for Good USA index. The long-term investors tend to increase their holdings if if it was added or lower their holdings if it was dropped. Um, In terms of investor patience, we find that within their own portfolios, the investors are less likely to sell a high ESG firm rather than a low ESG firm after after that firm has poor stock returns or an earnings shortfall. We also look at this after the shock. um, So when firms are added or dropped from the FTSE uh, Russell 
FTSE for good index. And, and we find that investors are more patient toward firms added to the index and less patient toward firms that are dropped from the index. So our, our data, and we're using two different, actually three different measures of ESG because we're gonna use the MSCI um, ESG scores. Uh, and and there have been uh, several studies about the problem of differences in ratings across firms. So we also are going to use sustainalytics. We don't have sustainalytics data for as long a period as we do for the for the MSCI. So MSCI is, is our our main source. Uh, but then we also use sustainalytics to check. Um, and then our third source is whether a firm is newly included or excluded in the FTSE for good um, US select index. Uh, we use a sample of institutional investors between 2000 and 2018. We use either actively managed mutual funds or we use the, the institutional investors that have to file their holdings um, uh, with the SEC. Um, and, and these filings are called 13F filings. Um, so MSCI rates firms on individual categories using a binary system. They have strength factors, they have weakness factors, and these are all aggregated and netted out. Okay, so uh, we measure um, portfolio turnover in, in two different ways. We measure it according to the percentage of the portfolio bought and sold over the period, which is usually a year as reported by the mutual funds. And then we also measure it by using a churn ratio, uh, which is which uh, Pedro and his co-authors um, uh, came up with. Uh, and, and this is how using the holdings of the institutional investors or the mutual funds, how frequently are they rotating their portfolio positions? And then, and then third, we use as a check, um, uh, Brian Boucher has a measure for 13F institutions. Again, these are the ones that do the filings, whether they're transient, um, so they're, they're short-term investors, whether they're dedicated investors or whether they're quasi-index investors. And, and his, uh, uh, classifications are based on um, the diversification of the portfolios and the length of the holdings. So our first hypothesis was that long-term investors are more interested than short-term investors in high ESG firms. And, and the first test was to measure the relationship between the average portfolio ESG scores and horizons. And this is just a very simple test to, to see what's happening. So, so we sort the mutual funds in the quintiles according to their investment horizon, and then calculate the average ESG score for the funds in each quintile. So this shows, um, this is the weighted average ESG score for the portfolios where we take their underlying holdings and, and aggregate the ESG scores of all the firms. And then, we, and then we've divided, um, the, the, the portfolios, the institutional investors into those uh, into quintiles according to their turnover. Um, and so, so we have the, the, um, the ones with low turnover of only about 20% in the long horizon, you can see it at the turnover um, increases. And so then we, have, we also have the short horizon quintile. And as you can see, there is a monotonic relationship between the ESG scores and the, and the horizons with the highest ESG scores um, with the investors that have long horizons and the lowest ESG scores with the investors that have short horizons. And we also find that the spread of ESG scores across these groups is economically meaningful because it represents 28% of the standard deviation of the fund level ESG scores. We also do this for the 13F institutions and find the same, the same results. Uh, but you know, one thing you may be asking is, well, are, do the characteristics of the portfolios explain these sorts? Um, and so we, act, we run a regression where we have the, the fund. So this is the portfolio level ESG score, which we've aggregated across the underlying companies. And then we 
We check to whether it's related to the horizon where we're using either the fund turnover ratio or the churn ratio. Um, and then we control for the different characteristics of the fund, such as size, investment objective, number of equity positions, um, and the characteristics of the fund's portfolio, such as the size of, of, the, of the underlying holdings in the fund, those companies, the book to market ratio of those companies and the recent returns on those companies. And then we control for, the, for time as well. And we find a significant negative relationship consistent with that graph I showed um, between the, the measures of, um, of fund trading turnover um, and which, which is our measure of horizon. So the, the higher these measures, the lower the horizon. And we find that, that the expected negative relationship between that and the mutual fund portfolio ESG score. Um, so one thing you might ask is, well, well, maybe you're just picking up the, um, the SRI funds and the SRI funds, because they have a more limited uh, set of companies to invest in, are going to have perhaps a, a uh, lower turnover because of that. Um, but the SRI funds are only 2% of our, of our total mutual fund sample. Um, and so when we, when we put in an indicator for the, um, the SRI funds and, uh, and, and, and we have the indicators separately too uh, among the other controls, I'm just showing the, the main, the main um, uh, results. The fund turnover ratio, this, this relationship doesn't change much, but we, we do find that the, um, so, so this relationship between these two doesn't change much, but we do find a relationship between uh, fund turnover and, and being an SRI fund. So, so, so it, it is the case that SRI funds have lower turnover, but it doesn't change our basic result for all mutual funds. That those that have longer horizons, in other words, lower turnover ratios are related to higher ESG scores. Um, okay, so, so then this also implies that in terms of the shareholder horizons, we should find that, that they firm shareholder horizon should be related to the firm's ESG score. So the previous results I showed were at the investor level. We now want to look at the firm level. And our dependent variable here is investor horizon. Uh, and then we have ESG um, as an independent variable, along with a number of, of controls. Um, so what we find in the firm level analysis, and, and again, no matter how, whether we are proxying the shareholder horizon with the mutual fund turnover, the churn ratio, um, or the Boucher classification, where this is the, the short-term investors, we find that the ESG score is, re, is negatively related to turnover, which means, again, that the firms that have higher ESG scores have longer term investors that are investing in them. And we've, con as I said, we've controlled for a number of different um, characteristics. Um, so, so, again, we find that. Uh, uh, this is a case whether we use MSCI scores or Sustainalytic scores, we find that controlling for firm characteristics, industry, and time period, the institutional shareholders of high ESG firms have longer horizons on average. Uh, but you know we have endogeneities. There may be other potential explanations. So we want to look at a shock to a firm's ESG profile to see whether the longer term investors actually change their holdings when the firm's ESG profile changes. And to do this, we use the FTSE for good um, US index rebalances. They rebalance the index every six months. Firms can be added or dropped depending on the investability of the firm. So the size of the firm or its ESG characteristics. We don't look at the ones where it's investability. We only look at the ones 
where they have um, been dropped or added based on their ESG characteristics because because in the announcement of the new index they explain the changes um, the the one caution about this is that when a, when a firm is dropped they've already been given a one-year grace period to improve their to improve their rating um, so we we again we look at um, whether the long-term investors change their ownership, around uh, this shock to firms ESG standing. And we match stocks with similar stocks on the basis of size and industry. We compare two quarters before the rebalance event to the two quarters after the rebalance event. And we run tests at the investor portfolio level and at the firm ownership level. So again, we're looking at, at both sides of this. Um, we find that uh, some evidence for exclusion events, but our stronger evidence is actually for inclusion events. And I think this makes sense because it, uh, and this is where we've matched the firms. I think this makes sense because for the exclusion events, there's usually been some kind of news about the firm. And, and again, since they only rebalance every six months, it's, it, the, that knowledge is already gonna be in the market. But for the inclusion events, the fact that that FTSE Russell finds uh, this firm to be to to be justified to go into their limited index, um, that's I believe that's why we find stronger results for inclusions. Um, so we find that the long-term investors are more likely to buy the firms newly included in FTSE for good. And we also find looking at the firms, newly included, included in FTSE for good, they're more likely to have longer term investors after the inclusion. And I already talked about that. So um, a further hypothesis is whether within their own portfolios, the institutional investors are more patient with the high ESG firm man managers than other firm managers. Um, and, and, and again, you know, we, we've already talked about how some investors are longer term. So we want to look within an institutional investor's own portfolio. So we're comparing these firms with other firms in their portfolios. Um, so so we, the two tests are, are they less likely to sell the firm stock after poor returns or sh earning shortfalls? In other words, are they more patient and then, and so that's just kind of a zero one. And then the second test is, do they sell less of the firm stock um, after the poor returns or earnings shortfalls? And we find um, that, that yes, this is true, that they are using both, just are they less likely to sell? We find this to be the, to be the case. Um, and then uh, in, in general, this first line shows that, that the investors are more likely to sell after earning shortfall or poor stock returns uh, and they're and more likely to sell more. But then we find that this is mitigated for firms that have higher ESG scores. Okay, so, so again, the long-term investors are less likely to sell the highest ESG firms in their portfolios and the low ESG firms in their portfolios after poor stock returns or earnings shortfalls. Uh, and then we look again at the shock and whether investor patience matters after the shock. And we find some evidence that um, with, with um, the, the using seasonally adjusted earnings, earnings growth, or in other words, uh, a miss in earnings or um, deviation from analyst uh, earnings, we, we, find, we find some evidence um, that there is a reaction with a negative earnings surprise and that it's, it, there's less of a reaction after um, they, they're added or removed from the FTSE for good index. Um, so what we found is if they're newly included in the FTSE for good index, they're less likely to be sold after poor stock returns or earnings shortfalls. If they're newly excluded from the FTSE for good index, 
they're more likely to be sold. They're more likely to be sold after poor stock returns or earnings shortfalls. Um, and I'm not sure how much more time do I have, Petro? You um, keep going. I, five, ten minutes. Oh, okay. I've been going so fast. I'm, I won't be taking that long. So, okay. So, over if we look over time at what um, at what's been happening to the ownership of ESG firms. We divided the ESG firms into quartiles. So the blue are the, are the lowest ESG scoring firms. The red are the highest ESG scoring firms. And you can see, and, and then we adjusted um, using the Daniels, Greenblatt, Titman and Wormers um, uh, characteristics. Um, so that, so that the idea here is to control for other characteristics of the firm than the ESG, than their ESG profile. We find that in the early part of the sample period, the uh, mutual funds were more likely to be holding firms in the high, in the lowest ESG quartile, less likely to be holding firms in the lowest ESG quartile. But then there was a shift, um, kind of after the financial crisis. And you see that more recently, firms have been more likely to, or the mutual funds have been more likely to own uh, firms in the highest ESG quartile than firms in the lowest ESG quartile. So there's been a change in mutual fund ownership preferences toward ESG firms over time. Okay, so just to, to go back and, and just hammer home the, the, the major findings, the longer term investors weight their portfolios toward high ESG firms relative to short term investors. The high ESG, at the firm level, the high ESG firms have greater proportions of longer term investors. And when there's a shock, the long term investors change their holdings, increasing their holdings when a firm is added um, to the FTSE for Good index and decreasing their holdings when the firm is dropped. Uh, again, with the investor patients, we find that the long-term investors are more patient with high ESG firms than the low ESG firms in their portfolios. So um, after a firm has poor stock returns or an earnings shortfall, they're less likely to sell the, to sell the high ESG firms relative to the low ESG firms. Um, and we find that this is magnified after the shock of the of the firm being either added to the FTSE for good index or dropped from the FTSE for good index. Okay, so, so we believe our results imply that there are real effects of firms improving their ESG profiles. If companies would like to attract longer term investors, one way they could do so is by improving their ESG profiles. And since having a longer term oriented shareholder base is claimed to be desirable, companies may have strong incentives to do good to have the right investors. Thank you. Obrigado, okay. <laughs> Laura. So, um, Rui, you have a question and maybe we could start there and, and mute yourself perhaps if you if you want. Yeah, just to get a, and I, I guess the idea to have more of a Q&A at the end anyway, but uh, I guess just a Curiosity, because we had a presentation with Lobos yesterday, and he talked a lot about E actually focusing on the green side and not on S and G. Um, would be interesting to know what your like your thoughts or work that you have done on separately looking at E, S, and G in this kind of analysis. Because like one thing that we saw yesterday is that the E is very somehow connected to growth stocks. Yeah, so the growth industries. Mm -hmm. And maybe the long-term investors care more about growth or they are growth funds. And I know you have some controls uh, in some of the regressions, but I would right. be interested to have a, maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, yeah I'm trying to remember. We, I, I, I remember, so, oh, so what we did do, we used E and S separately. We took out the G because the people's concerns about G that G was driving it. And what we found was with the, um, with the ENS, we found the same results. Um, uh, I don't think we separated ENS. I, 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 my bet is that E is driving the ENS results in, in our sample period, because I think S 
became much more important in the last year um, with, the, with the pandemic. And so the, in- the relation between E and growth stocks, yeah, we do have like book to market ratio in there. We're controlling for it. Um, and so I hopefully that's, that's helping us with that. Connecting the two papers and to Rui's point, like climate change is, and Laura has other work also uh, exploring the shock that came from the Paris Accord in 2015. And it, it, there's been a bigger trend, but Laura can speak to on the, on the social dimension, the social conversation here in the US, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, and many other things are probably more more recent. Now, that's not necessarily true all over the world. There has been different right. conversations right. going right. over. But, but uh, that's a, an interesting point. Uh, maybe for future work to tease out um, you know, the different focuses uh, investors might have based on the social um, dimension. So Laura, Laura has another work as well on, on uh, CEO composition and the media um, you know, uh, attitude towards that. So that might be some interesting work to, uh, to, to tease that out. Laura, I, um, I had a question myself and I wanted to encourage others as well. Uh, if you have questions um, for, for Laura to, to drop on the chat. Um, you, you did say that it's broader than the SRI. So the, the SRI being those specialized funds, they're still mm-hmm. a, a small fraction and therefore you expand it, a small fraction of the EUM and therefore you expand it towards the 13F. On the other hand, the instrument or sort of the identification comes from the FTSE. And do you have a sense how many investors really care of how or our benchmark or are following um, SRI type or you know indices or ESG type indices um, as we speak or are you know um, re, uh, reallocating uh, their even if they're actively managed they're reallocating uh, because of exclusions or 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 um, out of those indices. I don't. I. I... I don't know how, how many, it wasn't, for our sample period, it was, there were not a lot of fund, mutual funds that were actually following mm-hmm. some kind of indices. Uh, there were more of, um, of pension funds um, and other types of asset owners that were using FTSE for good um, in their, in their, investment selections. Great. Andrea from the Q&A box, Andrea Minardi, there's one question I wanted to uh, throw in quickly and then we'll move on to, to Aaron for the second paper. So she's asking, what? why cannot they be patient enough, the, the ESG investors to uh, wait for the increase in ESG ratings? And have you ever analyzed like you know, long-term changes. Uh, that is, they may, it may, in other words, the, the long-term investors might, tar, you know, might um, go for the low, you know, low rated and try to engage and change oh. them over over time. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, re- rewording the question and uh, maybe that's a broader question. No, I think, I, 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 and, and I think, uh, another way to answer that are the studies that have looked at engagement on ESG and found um, uh, one is, is um, Dimson, Caracas, and Lee, and they have found that engaging on ESG has actually um, worked in some sense. So, so getting to that, yes, there are investors who engage. Um, I have a paper on uh, downside risk. Um, and ESG, and, and, and in there we find that, uh, and engagement, and there we find that after a company engages, there's less downside risk, and, and that's, we find this is particularly the case for environmental, because this, this um, investor engages for themselves and others, and, and they keep records of what the topics of their engagement. And so we, we were able to get that data and look at that. Thank you. So um, I will move on to, to the second paper and, and also to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of ESG, Aaron's uh, uh, within the accounting faculty at, at Kellogg. 
and um, you know, there's a lot of work coming out in the intersection of the, of the, the two fields. So we're very pleased to, to have Aaron go next on, on, the, on the program and he, he'll be presenting uh, do high ability managers choose ESG projects that create shareholder value. Uh, go ahead, Aaron, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Pedro, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, Ray and Alan, uh, for giving me this great opportunity um, to showcase my research, uh, you know, alongside of such, you know, very distinguished senior academics like Laura. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Yoon at Northwestern Kellogg, and uh, please excuse me if my voice is slightly sort of uh, on the lower end. It's uh, 12 a.m. here, so I'm, I'm, I'll try to squeeze my uh, voice out uh, for the audience. Um, this paper is titled, Do High Ability Managers Choose ESG Projects That Create Shareholder Value? So as evident in this paper, uh, you can pretty much tell that my sort of interest is to sort of identify this link between ESG and shareholder value. And I'll sort of try to blend in some of my, um, you know, anecdotal sort of stories and personal experiences uh, alongside. This paper is with uh, a good friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Kyle Welch, who's also an accounting academic at uh, George Washington. So motivation is actually very simple. Uh, there's this ESG has grown tremendously. Um, this graph, um, which you guys probably already know, is a figure that represents how UNPRI grew so fast. Uh, 15 years ago, the AUM of signatories was two to $300 billion. This increased up to 120 trillion US dollars by 2020. You know, there's a lot of practitioners here, I bet. So we know how a large $220 trillion is, right? US market cap's like 40. So at least three times the entire US market cap has signed this great initiative to incorporate ESG issues. And uh, obviously, you know, you know, recent working papers such as uh, Pedro's and, and mine examine sort of this ESG performance of UNPRI signatory and their strategy, right? But the story or the key essence is that more and more block holders are demanding firms to engage in ESG issues. This is not unique to, uh, this ESG growth is not unique to investors. It's also a very big thing on companies these days. You know, I'm in South Korea at the moment, and um, everyone is an ESG, ESG expert. All the companies are like, you know, we are number one in Korea in ESG issues. All the institutional investors are like, we are on the forefront of global leader of ESG issues. And you ask them what ESG is, and they can't really even spell out an acronym. That's sort of the, the you know, the, the situation that we're living in. Um, an exemplary uh, um, sort of uh, initiative from the company side or the issuer side is Business Roundtable 200. That represents um, 200 largest companies, in essence, uh, in the U.S., their CEOs. And they came out 2019 summer uh, with this lovely, you know, and very sort of, um, you know, honorable message of redefining the role of companies from shareholders to stakeholder focus. And th th this caused a lot of debate, right? You know, whether this should be and all these things. I wanted to sort of note that there are few issues with ESG space in general, along with this growth, big growth trend, is that this ESG is a very confusing thing. You know, we have uh, 65 participants in this room right now. And if we ask what ESG, you know, if I ask what ESG means to every one of us, I'm sure we will have at least 50 answers, right? Um, you know, because it's multidimensional, you know, it's transitioning from CSR, SRI to ESG, et cetera. And, uh, you know, Pedro highlighted this two very different streams of thought with respect to ESG or sustainability or even CSR, SRI. Uh, you know, the two streams of thought are shareholder primacy folks, you know, led by, you know, sort of this Jensen stream of thought and the uh, stakeholder theory, you know, led by, you know, sort of Freeman, you know, stream of thought. What Kyle and I, you know, uh, observed is that the two groups both agree that ESG does not put shareholder value first, at least at the very, very high level. But interestingly, the day that we are living in right now, virtually every firms are engaging in ESG, right? 
And if we have a buy-in that ESG is using firm resources, then it has to come out to value somehow. And how do you sort of identify that value is the big motivation of this, this research paper. So formally stated, the research question of this paper is, can high ability managers allocate to ESG in a way that enhances shareholder value? So I, you know, Kyle and I are viewing this ESG as a constrained optimization problem. You know, regardless of whether they think it enhances shareholder value or not, or it puts shareholder value first or not, managers are forced to do it these days, right? By institutional investors, asset owners, and asset managers. And under this circumstance, you know, can high ability managers choose ESG projects that would enhance shareholder value? That is sort of the overarching question. And the reason we believe so is because, you know, sort of we're building on these sort of echelon theory in, you know, in economics. And also simply because manager compensations are tied to shareholder value. So if they are forced to do it, or if I'm forced to do it, and if I'm a CEO, I will obviously choose an ESG project that enhances shareholder value. That's sort of the gist of the paper. So let me give you some details on how we do this. Um, how do we identify high ability CEOs? You know, for those of you, I, I'm not sure if Wendy's is a thing in, the, in, in Brazil, but um, in the States where I grew up in Illinois, you know, middle of nowhere, uh, Wendy's used to be sort of a very, um, you know, popular place, right, for high school, you know, kids and all these. And I found this billboard quite interesting. It says, uh, our secret ingredient is our people now hiring. So how do we identify high ability CEOs? We use the people. Specifically, we use the Glassdoor data. Um, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure whether Glassdoor data is popular in Brazil, but, um, you know, it's in the UK and it's in the US and it's sort of picking up. And there are um, survey sort of organizations as of sort, even in Korea, obviously title something different. So I'm sure there are, uh, you, know, uh, you know, something of an equivalent in Latin, uh, Latin America, but um, essentially you rate a company and you type in your company's name, right? And, you know, you as an employee, you know, would give this overall rating of the company, which is from one through five. And you can mark whether you're a current or a former employee, you know, whether you're a full-time or part-time or a contractor, your, you know, your job title, you know, what you think about the company as a title, you know, and what the pros and cons are, the advice to the management, and also optional other ratings, such as ratings on career opportunities, uh, comps and benefits, excuse me, uh, work-life balance, uh, their views on senior managers, and culture and values. So what we do is we use um, employee views on senior management as a main construct for high-ability managers, but we also use all the others for robustness tests, uh, you know, because obviously they would be very highly correlated, right? So to give you a very quick uh, summary of our paper in two slides, uh, first is that this is a two by two of our stock returns or annualized alpha. And uh, this two by two has two axes. Uh, our Y axis is ESG performance, which, you know, obviously it has limitations, but we use, uh, we follow the prior literature and use it as a proxy for how much firms invest in ESG issues. And our X axis is senior manager ability, which is from Glassdoor data. We double sort, so we have high, low, high, low, and we have four quadrants. So when firms invest a lot in ESG issues or ESG you know, investments, and uh, when there are high ability senior managers, this portfolio of firms generate about 5% annualized alpha, controlling for the latest FAMA French 2016 paper, the five factors. All the rest, so when you have high ESG investments, but not so good senior manager ability, you actually have a negative two and a half percent alpha, or we're roughly right around there. When you don't invest much on ESG, but have poor senior manager, proxied by uh, what you might call it, um, uh, employee views, you generate roughly negative two percent alpha, 
And um, when you have high manageability, but you don't invest much on ESG issues, you're roughly stuck with about a 1% alpha. Um, I always, you know, I used to uh, trade stocks at, at a firm called Credit Suisse in my previous life as a sales trader. So I love to put these in a, in a quick graph. Um, we use signal from 2011 to 2018. So obviously we would use this signal, start our portfolio uh, creation process starting 2012, rebalance every year, very typical sort of quant, you know, long, short type of approach. So our high group, which is our pur purple group, is high ESG investment, high CEO ability group. Our low group is the gray guys. It's low ESG and low CEO ability. This is the five factor alpha. And uh, when we rebalance every year, uh, put a dollar rebalance every year, roughly eight, nine years later, we're, we're right around $4 for the high high group, but roughly around a little north of $2 uh, for the uh, low ESG CEO ability group. So with this sort of very basic results in mind, let me show you some of the empirics. When I first started this project, so my co-author Kyle has a magic of, um, you know, getting data from very, you know, proprietary data. And when he pitched me this with this idea, my pushback was, hey, Kyle, ESG and employee satisfaction or employee views on manager, it should be very highly correlated and we're going to get killed. Interestingly, um, ratings on senior manager, ratings on firm from Glassdoor essentially has, or all the Glassdoor ratings, which are obviously highly correlated here, right? One through six or one through six, yeah. They're very, essentially there's no correlation to MSCI's ESG score, which was incredibly surprising to us. MSCI ESG score, roughly covers Russell 3000 these days. It is the most comprehensive ESG scores used by, at least in the US. I'm not sure about Latin America, but in the US space, right? So we, we examined the correlation between these glass door ratings, one through six, to MSCI's S score with a guess that, oh, it, it, it'll have to be very correlated. The correlation was essentially zero again. So we went into S's uh, granular factors and parsed out those factors that are related to employees only. So employee, you know, uh, compensation, employee well-being, you know, et cetera, maternity, you know, all these things, right? The highest correlated factor was correlated at, at the 8%. So still very low correlation. So we talked to MSCI about this and our, our sort of conclusion is uh, at least threefold. So first explanation is that these ESG scores are a uh, composite score of many things, right? With a hand-waved uh, weighted average, right? Second, these are usually using firm level disclosures. So for example, policies on the work-life balance, plus a subjective view of an MSCI analyst, right? So that obviously, you know, when I look at, you know, the sky, I could say it's blue, but my son could say it's, uh, you know, light blue, right? So there's a little bit of a subjectivity involved in that process. But also our third point is that we, Kyle and I view that Glassdoor's ESG rating is actually bringing something new on the table to the social dimension. The reason we think is, is, is the following. Uh, well, you know, the straight answer to this is that one of the large data vendors, after seeing our paper, has purchased Glassdoor data to embed it into their uh, uh, ESG scores. And, you know, we got a special thank you from Glassdoor. So maybe that's a one speculation. But second speculation is, is, is actually the real reason. So imagine if there is a very, uh, a very capable athlete, you know, that that particular athlete could be very muscular or very fast or both. I think what we are measuring is potentially another angle of S that has been missed. And S, there is a lot of subjectivity involved, right? It's not as clear cut as G where, you know, you have X amount of female board members or E as yeah, obviously E is, you know, bringing into question by academics as well, but at least, you know, it's more measurable and quantifiable. So, you know, we sort of, we thought this institutional feature was very interesting. And also, 
um, sort of alleviates some of our worry that we are using two very correlated signals. At least, you know, we view from this correlation table that we are using quite independent signals. So with that in mind, our portfolio construction process, you know, is very, very standard stuff. Um, ESG and employee satisfaction data from ERT, double sorting it, creating portfolios from Jan of T plus one to December T plus one, equal weighted, valuated, you know, quartile uh, is our main cut, but we do tercile and quintile as well. Uh, for robustness tests, we risk adjust by, you know, controlling for the five factors from the latest Fama French uh, 2016 uh, paper. Uh, just to give you some sense on our sample development, um, we are essentially roughly working with S&P 1500 companies starting 2012. Uh, Glassdoor um, data, if I recall correctly, starts from 2009, but when we merge it with uh, MSCI and, and et cetera, et cetera, this is uh, where, where we start 2011, but you, know, you can see that it's very thin the first year. The reason we are thin in the latest year is that uh, we were only able to uh, get data uh, until 2018 June from Glassdoor. So that's sort of the limitation, but uh, we're working with roughly 1 million employee survey data, which we think is you know, uh, potentially an add value and a, a potentially a new way of looking at uh, employee, uh, you know, high ability senior managers. Um, so main results. Our equal weighted results, I have eight columns here, so it could be potentially a little overwhelming. Our eighth column is our long portfolio, high ESG and high rating on senior management or high ability senior managers. Our first column is low ESG, low rating on senior management, so our short portfolio. We compare it across systematically all these different sorts, but let me brief you really quickly. Uh, but uh, first of all, let me highlight that we put the annualized alpha of each portfolio here, and then we compare it to our long portfolio. So essentially like a back testing, right, uh, for a typical quant type of strategy. So we have low ESG, high rating on senior manager. So let, sorry, let me back up. So our short portfolio, the annualized alpha is roughly negative 2%. And the long short difference between the long is uh, about almost 7%. Our low ESG high rating on senior manager, roughly 1%. So the difference is slightly south of four. High ESG low rating on senior manager, the long short portfolio creates roughly 7%. We also compare our long to low ESG, high ESG, and our long outperforms both. And um, low rating on senior management is senior management is another group, and high rating on senior management is another group. You see in column seven, uh, for the group that um, has high rating on senior manager or high ability senior manager, this group provides roughly about 2.2% alpha. This is consistent with uh, what Alex, um, Alex Edmonds find in his 2011 paper using best 100 best companies to work for. He finds roughly about two and a half to 3% alpha using the three and a four factor model. So for us, this um, column seven gave us a lot of comfort. And what gave us more comfort is that our long portfolio actually outperforms column seven by two and a half percent at the five percent level, which gave us um, a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, you know that we're, we're really onto something. Um, our value rated results are pretty much identical, telling us that this phenomenon potentially may not be just be limited to bigger firms. It's actually sort of generally spread across, you know, all sides. And, um, you know, I was, you know, I, you know I, I've been told by senior colleagues that it used to be enough to have just these two tables and you'd be able to convince your readers, but obviously you need additional tests, right? So, you know, we cut into tercile and quintile, find similar results. You know, our, you know, first two columns are equated. The next two are evaluated. We cut them into uh, sub periods. Uh, we actually find that our uh, second half, 2016 to 2019, is what is driving our results. I do have a few speculations to it, but you know, I don't want it to you know, uh, you know, delve into too much detail. And um, also, the results are robust to using three and four factor al you know, alpha, following, following French 93 and Carhartt 97. 
obviously, you know, this calendar time portfolio regression approach, you know, we don't control for these uh, farm level covariates. So we first put them into Fama Macbeth type of regression model. And um, our results are pretty much the same, if not a little stronger. Uh, we also put them into panel regression because these days people are concerned about, oh, what about these firm level or time level invariant characteristics? Thankfully, our results are still there even after controlling for, you know, firm and year month fixed effects and also clustering by firm and time. So year month. Um, we also use other glass door signals to sort of see what's going on. We know they're already highly correlated, right? But um, essentially the same results, but interestingly, the results are driven by, or the, we get the strongest results, even stronger than our main result, when we use rating on work-life balance. So just wanted to sort of point that out. Lastly, we do a cross-sectional cut um, by employee type. So as you may have recalled that Glassdoor um, example that I gave you, there were areas where an employee when filling out the survey could fill out whether you are a current or a non-current and full-time, part-time contractor, et cetera. Our results are stronger for current employees rating, which makes sense, right? Because they would obviously um, be a better sort of predictor of um, you know, senior manager ability, at least in my opinion, right? Because if I'm, you know, if I work with the guy right now, you know, I would know much more than, you know, folks, you know, who used to work much before. And also when we do part-time and full-time cut, the results are essentially fully driven by the full-time employees. Uh, I didn't even put contractor because there's no results for contractors. And this to us made a lot of sense because, you know, part-time employees with no CEO, you know, at least they would experience more of the CEO, much more so than uh, part-time and contractor employees. So, um, you know, thank you again for, you know, your audienceship. Um, my research agenda has been to examine the link between ESG investments and shareholder value. And I think, um, you know, ESG is a very interesting area because even accounting academics could really, um, I think, you know, contribute to the debate and also work alongside of economists and, you know, financial economists because accountants are in the business of accounting for things. And ESG is a very hard, you know, area. You know, when we look at papers like Berg et al., the recent, uh, you know, Roberto's paper with Florian, um, that ESG is everywhere. There's an aggregate confusion, right? And um, in, in this paper, you know, I've highlighted that ESG enhances shareholder value when there are high ability managers in charge. And we view that the mechanism and the story is very simple because when, you know, virtually all the managers are forced to do ESG in some shape or form, potentially high managers, uh, high ability managers would choose projects that would enhance shareholder value. And obviously because their compensation is tied to price. So thank you very much uh, again for the opportunity. You know, this is really an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So Rui, do you want to, to start with yeah, your question? I can get started here. So a very interesting paper, Aaron. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, actually, like I found interesting in the first two tables that you showed the, uh, it with the EW and evaluated uh, mm. uh, results that I guess if I'm not mistaken, actually, a lot of the spread is coming from the within the long ISG. portfolio. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the long portfolio. So like a lot of the difference, actually, 6.9, the difference there, seven, almost seven. Yeah. Um, oh, right here, you mean? Yeah. So like compared to the low, low versus that's high, right. high. That's right. Yeah. High, low uh, versus high. Uh, high mm -hmm. actually is like roughly the same. So. Does it mean that actually you're getting something that is kind of classifying better the highest ESG companies and not so much about the cross high and low ESG companies? And my follow-up questions like related on the, I guess you even mentioned during the presentation that ESG is very dominated by E, yes? So what happens when you do the same things for S and G only, yes? Or um, because like maybe this, your measure, which is very interesting, may be more related maybe to the S component, but like, uh, it seems not to be related to any of them. Yeah, I guess I'm uh, okay with that, but 
Maybe yeah. it could be uh, E could be more independent somehow. Yeah. Um, so we should for sure try um, E S N G separately. I think uh, if I recall correctly, we have tried it, and um, if I recall correctly, and we didn't tabulate this, the results are actually coming from the S investments that firms make. Um, you know, we weren't sure how to sort of make sense of it. And, um, you know, this paper is obviously a very new paper. So, you know, obviously we're in the camp of let's present, you know, our strongest result that we can make sense of and sell, you know, and, and then sort of wait for referees to give us the grace to revise the paper. So that's sort of the status of the paper. But um, to answer your first question, you know, the reason we created this sort of, obviously, you know, one in three, uh, you know, they wouldn't be statistically uh, different, right? But I, I do feel that this is a very important comment that you made because this high ESG reflects sort of the current nature, right? When everyone's sort of forced to do it, you know, you need a good sort of ability uh, CEOs. I think that is, that we can potentially highlight this, uh, the third column a little stronger to sell the results, I think. And, um, you know, it's funny because uh, whenever, you know, I've been sort of presenting this paper a few times, several times already, and, and to practitioners too, actually. And uh, whenever practitioners see this, you know, they're like, oh, column eight is us. You know, they're like, it, it's, it's our story. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, there's a difference between ESG disclosure and ESG performance. And a lot of these ESG scores are based on ESG disclosure, right? Plus sort of this discretion by ESG analysts from MSCI or Sustainalytics, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder sort of, you know, potentially as a separate paper or, you know, separate just exercise to see sort of how do you even disentangle that ESG disclosure and performance and whether a market sees through it. You know, I, I, I doubt that market is able to see through it. Uh, given sort of how nascent this area is, but I think they will eventually, right? So for example, uh, there's a big company called SK in Korea, which is the second largest company in Korea as a conglomerate. And they are, they claim that they're number one in ESG and they have all these ESG initiatives and all these things. But, um, you know, one of their, uh, their one of, not their owner, but their CEO is uh, um, being prosecuted for, uh, you know, um, bribery and something else. So, you know, people ask me, because I'm Korean ethnically, you know, I, it's not like I spent much time in Korea. They were like, oh, you know, do you, you know, isn't SK the number one ESG performer? And it's very difficult for me to say because, you know, these ESG outcomes that, you know, that come very, very, you know, news and outcomes that come you know, not too long after, you know, these big highlights, you know, on the media, you know, that, you know, you're, you're put in jail or you're being investigated and all these things, right? So... So Aaron, uh, uh, for, there are a couple questions from the oh, there are. Oh. but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get to those. I'll read them for you in a second. Mm -hmm. But ge generally, mm -hmm. just to follow up on your thought, a very good point about disclosure and performance um, mm -hmm. in this low correlation you ha you highlighted between Glassdoor mm -hmm. and MSCI. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, what we're th seeing here is sort of a growth in crowdsourced or news data or other big data, like you have other work also with True Value Labs. The you know the, the information set uh, to make the judgment call on on how uh, good ESG performance a company is. So mm -hmm. um, so how do you see sort of the role of the ratings versus the role of you know, we can source this data ourselves as investors or Rui, uh, if he's working for Centenary Asset Management yeah. or others out there in, in, the, in the audience who are, uh, you know, investing versus relying on, on the ESG uh, rating provider. So how do you see this, this tension between using one and the other more broadly? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably too junior to answer that question, but I do have my own view. So currently, uh, ESG rating space is just aggregate confusion. So, uh, right. And uh, when you talk to asset managers, their classic excuse is, uh, oh, e we try, we have an ESG fund, we try our best, uh, which they do in most cases, but they're like, you know, ESG is confusing, so we can't really do anything about it. At least when I talk to my you know, old colleagues in the US and Hong Kong, that's sort of their general response. So when I used to sales trade at 
sales trade at Credit Suisse uh, 12 or whatever years ago, when, when I used to call clients, the response that I got from, and I'm sure this is not representative response, but the response that I got from my client investors who are big investors like BlackRock and et cetera, is that Wall Street analysts add no value to their lives because all the EPS forecasts are right next to each other. So 12 years later, I'm an academic and I talked to my old colleagues who I still kept, kept in touch with. Their response is so different. And I tease them all the time about this. You know, why do you charge high fees and, uh, you know, or the same fees and you tell, you you know, right? But what I've been pitching them is that it's an opportunity area, right? But then their issue, I agree with them uh, fully because ESG raters are still confused and they don't even know what outcome these their ESG rating should fruit to. And you have a bunch of data vendors that reverse engineer their data ratings on stock returns. Uh, this is the truth, right? I mean, we, we all know this, right? It's like an open secret. So how do you guide them, right? And from an accounting angle, I believe that voluntary disclosures that these data vendors um, you know, base their ratings on should be actually be a public good. So investors, different investors would have different investment theses, theses on what ESG would mean to them and how to identify financial materiality of ESG issues, right? So if so, then I believe that, you know, if, if for example, an organization like SEC or someone else could create like a like a like a database of disclosure that um, different investors or even retail investors could tap into and then have their own score or own sort of base looking at different ESG disclosure and making investment decisions. And I think that if that's the case, then a lot of the noise in the data uh, vendors um, uh, would, would decrease. And the reason I say this is because when I was a graduate student, you know, I, you know, Obviously, even when I was working at Credit Suisse, I used to, you know, create long short portfolios using a bunch of signals. And I've, in, you know, sort of asked them, you know, do you have the raw data, back data? And most of them do. But there are cases when back data is all of a sudden missing or it used to be there, but, you know, the old person, you know, didn't give it to the new person. So there's all these issues with the data. And... ESG is a weird area because you can't embed this, this into a typical valuation framework, right? Because a, a model like DCF or what you would call it, like multiples, you have to base it on financial statements. And ESG, you can't do that, right? How do you put it into WAC or cash flow growth assumptions, right? So this is an area that needs very clear data. Um, and the logic behind uh, how they came out with the ratings. And I think the raters are working on this for sure, right? So, so maybe um, let me open up to Laura for, for her thoughts on this um, avail you know, rapid growth availability, not ESG data, but there are some concerns whether it's, you know, the dispersion on ratings or uh, some greenwashing as well, where firms may, <laughs> like SK may, may, we have very good scores, as, as Aaron pointed out. Um, what, how do you think about the issue of, of uh, data quality and data uh, ESG ratings broadly? Well, I think, I think one issue is the subjectivity of the ratings and the fact that many of the analysts are very passionate about ESG. And so it, it would be interesting if someone could figure out the biases that get embedded in, in these in these ratings um, I don't know but but I have a a, a question for Aaron which is um, whether you have thought about looking at the shock of 2020 in your your results because because I would think they should make them stronger potentially so no, working, I, I, working I think, from home and, and so forth, like for the, sure. the pandemic shock. Yeah, no, well, I think well, that's and, a and, great idea. And mm -hmm. not, and, and, but also the fact that investors have become so much more interested in the S part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I also like to ask a question to Aaron in, in line with, or closely related to what Laura asked. Uh, Aaron, 
Well, first of all, great paper, actually both great papers in our ESG session, another success for our conference. But our my question actually is, um, at, le at least there, there are two factors that I'm wondering that could actually explain part of uh, or part or are important for your result. First one is sectors. So we have sectors where we know they are more aggressive in terms of uh, working like as you work for Credit Suisse, you know how is working in financial market. But it's completely different if you work, for instance, in um, uh, telecom or and so how is the sector factor impacting your results? So for, basically the glass door uh, yes. evaluation. So have you control for that? And yeah. the second one is mm -hmm. also related for age. We know, for instance, millennials tend to be more uh, uh, engage on evaluating the companies they work with uh, yeah. rather than older generations like me. I, I, in general, when I don't like my job, I quit my job. I don't say uh, I don't like to work with you and I stick a different one. While millennials try to engage, say, no, this is a bad company, don't work there. So how uh, uh, actually is possible to control for that? Have you control for that? And what are your thoughts on that? So these are two very, very excellent questions. So first is, um, I think, uh, consistent with uh, Gabriel's comment on the Q&A Q box. So we didn't control for um, industry uh, initially because, you know, typically, you know, if I'm a French factor, factors, you know, you don't really do an industry twist, right? But we did it by industry. And actually, our results are mainly driven by consumer discretionary sector. And then a little bit IT, a little bit healthcare, but all the other stuff, there's there's nothing. And um, so, you know, we thought about, you know, why would CEO ability matter so much, you know, you know, in these ESG investments? And, you know, oftentimes consumer discretionary is where, when the employees are more most client facing, right? Uh, so, you know, we thought it was a pretty interesting result. We debated on putting the results in the paper or not because, uh, you know, as a junior, you know, academic, we don't know how much to actually show, you know, before our, you know, referee gives us a chance, right? So this is sort of a, but the millennial part, we haven't actually done it. And this is a great suggestion. You know, we will for sure do it because um, you're right. You know, we can actually separate boomers and then um, generation, um, I forgot what the, X, that's right. Yes, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and then, and then, and then uh, what you call the millennials and the, um, De Aaron, definitely do there's... you want to identi identify yourself on the, on the scale? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm definitely a millennial. Apparently, you know, millennials are over 40 these days, you know, so, uh, um, but no, for sure. So I, I think that that really gets at the granularity of the data too. Um, so thank you for, you know, these suggestions. Um, do you want to take any of the other questions from the Q&A box? Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I will take uh, Sandro's question. So Sandro's question is, um, you, know, you know, which ESG index, why did you choose MSCI essentially? The only reason we chose MSCI is that um, uh, we get the most N of companies. Uh, Sustainalytics covers slightly, uh, their coverage is lower. So when we merge it with uh, Glassdoor's data, we get slightly about 70% of our, uh, our sample. And then when we use Thompson, we only get about 40% of our sample. So that, that's the only reason. But uh, you, you know, you're right. So the um, Berg et al., you know, Florian and then Roberto's paper points out that ESG ratings um, have, um, whatchamacallit, uh, uh, you know, low correlation. So I, I do think that one potential weakness, not only for our paper, but, you know, the ESG literature in general is that which ESG is the right ESG rating to use, right? I think that is a key challenge that we all face. And I know that, um, I think Pedro, your paper with uh, F Philip, right? You also uh, do a normalized, um, you know, average of different ESG ratings. So I think that may put, be potentially one way to sort of address uh, this type of concern. And then uh, Marcelo said that, you know, how are the distribution of Glassdoor answers? 
That's a great question. So one issue that we had with Glassdoor as well as ESG scores is that they are all really pretty much next to each other. So the reason, um, you know, we use both quartile, uh, you know, quintile and tercile, we tried decile, but we just get very, very thin portfolios is to potentially alleviate a little bit of a concern. But we, we did find that Glassdoor data is quite lumpy and ESG data as well. And, you know, it actually reflects sort of for ESG data, it reflects how um, these ESG raters manage relationship with uh, companies. So for example, MSCI can, cannot give a very different rating to Samsung and LG who are essentially identical Korean companies. So when you look at a bunch of ESG vendors, Samsung and LG, their score is not too different. And it's, it's pretty much the case across, um, you know, competitors and, you know, within sectors. So, um, you know, that, that, that is also a potential sort of limitation with the, these, these data. And, you know, some people have used, you know, residual, uh, what you might call it, you know, indices after controlling for a bunch of firm characteristics. So that may be one way to potentially um, go about as well. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll uh, go turn to Laura on mm -hmm. her thoughts on also data, but more broadly open questions for research. There will be, you know, many people in the audience here, younger and other, you know, academics, um, students, etc. What would you say is the um, kind of, you know, high level in excitement uh, that you see in this in this area for you know, having been an editor and in a, in a major journal, um, what would you say is the appetite in the profession towards this this topics? I, I think there's I think there's a, a, apparently a large appetite, and um, I think about ESG, but but also the different components of ESG, um, and then climate climate finance. I think is is seems to be booming, um, and but also looking across countries uh, because, because we need more information. You know, Pedro, you do so much cross country work, but we need more information and particularly about differences between voluntary and mandatory disclosure um, and differences in the norm, social norms across the countries because uh, those vary. Great. So that's, um, that's there's, um, I think one more question, but um, I think we, we've pretty much uh, uh, um, narrowed down the, the main questions from, from the two papers. Uh, Rui, Alan, I, I do want to say another plug for the PRI, just in the sense that, um, you know, there are organizations out there, the United Nations Sponsored Principles for Responsible Investing, who want to encourage academic research. So the data I've used, but others is made available, um, but also, um, you know, the, the event I, I shared uh, before on the chat um, is, um, which is in September, is a way to have a conversation between academia and practitioners. So every paper gets an academic and a, a practitioner discuss. And so um, I encourage you guys to uh, look up those, those two um and um, and be part of the conversation there's a big appetite as, as laura said for research in brazil and and other other geographies beyond you know the the, the u.s samples um so rui and or alan do you guys want to close the session uh, just yeah no thank you very much uh i'd like to thank aaron uh, laura it was great to have you uh, here with us. Uh, actually, we'd like to have you here with us, <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll do that uh, next time. Uh, hopefully next year, uh, maybe it happens. And um, I, I guess like uh, ending the second session yesterday, uh, we need, need to uh, give big thanks to uh, Pedro. Like you've been great. It was, like two great sessions. Um, I guess we managed to select three papers covering a wide range of topics within SG and. Uh, was a very good discussion. And uh, I guess we encourage a lot of people in Brazil actually to pursue uh, uh, study, like trying to do more studies on the topic here. So uh, hopefully we will fill some of the gaps we, we raised to, uh, today. So great to have you all. And I hope uh, I see you soon in Brazil. Obrigado. 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 Obrigado.
Thank you. Okay.